You're in the water loop. <laughs> Hey everyone, this is Travis with Waterloop. I want to tell you about the Flume Smart Water Monitor that I use at my house. Flume is the perfect device for tracking your water usage in real time with your smartphone. You can see exactly how much water you're using with showers, toilets, sinks, appliances, outside irrigation, any way you use water. Flume lets you set daily, weekly, and monthly water budgets. It also alerts you if there's excessive water use and if it detects a leak. In fact, Right when I hooked up Flume at my house, it alerted me of a leak. I was losing a gallon of water every six minutes outside of my water line. It turns out it had been there for months, and I was wasting ridiculous amounts of water and money. I'm not sure when I would have found that without Flume. Flume was super easy to install. You wrap a band around your water meter, just like you put a watch on your wrist. Connect to Wi-Fi, download the app, and you're all set. No plumber needed. Now you can use promo code WATERLOOP to save 15% off of Flume at flumetech.com. With Flume, you'll never be surprised by a water bill again. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop. Welcome to Waterloop. This is Travis, joined by Jane Gilbert, Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Miami. Jane, thank you for coming on the podcast. It's a pleasure to be here, Travis. Yeah, I mentioned that the reason I, I tracked you down is I, I've always thought of Miami and how you all are really at just the forefront of the impacts of climate change, uh, right there on the water, uh, sea level rise, stronger storms, et cetera, et cetera. Then I recently saw an article about uh, a new plan that the city has put out about how you're going to build resilience and adapt and look to mitigate uh, you know, from climate change. So I'm, I'm happy to talk to you. I'm really curious, um, what are the effects that you're already seeing from climate change in Miami? Sure. So uh, the first is probably the, the, the impact that we're at least known for, which is increased heat. But it's quite common throughout, right? We've always had a tropical climate here. And so Miami is probably better prepared for increased heat than other communities. Most, of, most everyone has air conditioning. And so we're pretty prepared, but um, we've had 70 more days over 90 degrees a year since 1970. Wow. And that, you know, when you have young kids playing outside, outdoor workers, whether they're construction or landscape workers or, or a park staff, uh, when you have elderly or people with pulmonary uh, respiratory diseases, it, it, it makes it more difficult. And with the increasing impacts of storm, if you have a major power outage during a heat wave uh, where people can't access that air conditioning, that can also have um, the biggest impacts to human health and life, more so maybe even than the flood risk, um, just because of, of, of that. So I wanted to start with that because it's not the first thing in people's mind. Miami is does have more real estate assets at risk than any other city in the world to the impacts of sea level rise and storm surge, as, as articulated by the United Nations, not by us. <laughs> um, and uh, so it is a big issue. We luckily have had less impacts of increasing tidal flooding than our neighbors across the bay in Miami Beach. Miami Beach had it earlier starting 10, 15 years ago. And so we've had the benefit of learning from their implementation of different infrastructure improvements. We do have areas that have been impacted by tidal flooding along our shorelines and the Miami River and Little River, uh, but they're, they're more isolated. And what we've done in the last year is put in 50 uh, backflow prevention valves, tidal backflow valves to keep the water from going back up our storm surge, uh, storm sewers on a sudden. That's had a great impact. Um, so I'll get into other things we're doing, but just to finish the question around impact. So, so increasing tidal flooding, because Florida is built on a limestone bed, it was a coral reef many thousands of millennial years ago, uh, we 
have a porous limestone. So as the sea rises, so does our groundwater. Mm -hmm. And so that diminishes our drainage capacity for increasing more intense rain events. So we have flooding coming from the bay. We have it, you know, from below, from above, uh, and even, you know, from the side pressures from, from the Everglades. So um, that's the sort of more chronic flooding. And then you mentioned storm risk. So we've always been vulnerable to hurricanes. We've had 31 hit Miami since the mid 1800s. But with climate change, the impacts of storm surge are, are greater because of the sea level rise. The uh, because of heat, heat, heat up oceans, we're seeing more intense wind. And we're seeing, as you saw with Harvey and Dorian, higher rain events and and the storms are sitting over cities or sitting longer periods of time. So more time to dump rain and have impacts. So so those are more we're not seeing more hurricanes necessarily, but the impacts are greater. So we have to make sure we're prepared. The good thing is Miami has a lot of experience with hurricanes. So we, we have a lot of things already in place that we can build on. Wow, that's amazing how you all have it kind of, like you said, from all sides here, from, from the sides, from above, from below, uh, yes. from, from the sea, from the, from the Everglades. So you've got, got the challenges on all, on all angles there. Yeah, I've, um, <clears throat> you know, with the way the ocean temperatures are with these hurricanes, you know, they're just, uh, they could become so powerful. Uh, yeah. The wind part, the rain, it's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. So you, you started to mention some of the things that Miami's already doing to adapt. I'm really curious to dig into that. I, I was yeah. also curious to hear that Miami Beach is where they're already seeing water, you know, on the roads from yeah. sea level rise. I mean, yeah. I don't know if really people realize that. Um, is it predicted to start at some point kind of creeping into the city of Miami proper? No, it has, it in, has. in certain areas. And um, yeah, in certain areas in along our shores, and even along the Miami River, during those seasonal high tides in the fall, where you get both higher tides with the full or new moon, and then also the both spring and fall equinox, for some reason, draw a larger tide. But then with the fall, you get the thermal expansion over the summer in the ocean. So it's just that much more intense. So we can get tides that are running a foot to two feet more than your regular tide. Mm. And so those are higher than normal incidences. And if you get that compounded with any kind of storm or rain event, it can really cause greater amounts of flooding. The good news with a tide is that it goes out, right? So in three hours, it's gone. Mm -hmm. um, so, but we have had several areas, which is why we put in 50 backflow prevention valves. Uh, and have are working on a seawall ordinance to uh, require higher elevated seawalls. Miami Beach passed a stormwater bond of 400 million to imp and has been implementing infrastructure improvements throughout the city, raising roads, installing pumps, expanding drainage. We're just starting that. We passed a bond in 27, late 2017. And in addition to the backflow valves, I've been working on a uh, couple of neighborhood level drainage improvement projects that include the same sort of small road elevation, expanded drainage pumps. Um, and then we're doing two large, very demonstration projects where we're on waterfront properties where we're trying to integrate green and gray infrastructure to protect two different areas, one in our downtown Brickell area that experienced a lot of storm surge during Irma, and then one in East Little Havana on our Miami River. And using those as two demonstration projects where we can not only protect those communities from tidal events, storm surge, but create beautiful linear parks with increased shade and accessibility so that we're improving our quality of life at the same time. 
Yeah, that's one of the wonderful things about green infrastructure projects is you get these multiple benefits, right? It's not just managing yeah. that water, but the, it's beautiful stuff. It provides community assets, reduces heat, yada, yada, yada. I don't have to tell you, you know. You know. Um, what what else has, has Miami done already? You've mentioned a number of things. Are there other items you'd, you'd like to talk about and what, what the city's done to start adapting? Yeah, so I mentioned the Miami Forever Bond, which is really important. It's close to 200 million that the taxpayers pass to invest in stormwater flood prevention measures, 100 million in affordable housing, which we're gonna make sure is resilient, and, uh, and 78 million in parks and cultural facilities, again, that we're gonna make sure is resilient. So, so overall, we call it a resilience bond, and that's really given us a great shot in the arm to move forward on different projects. Uh, last year, we released a regional resilience strategy called Resilient 305 in partnership with Miami-Dade County and Miami Beach. And really that's looking at not only the impacts of climate change, but the impacts of increased density in our city. Miami has been a really fast growing city. We've become this global, you know, people wanna be here, not only residents, but visitors. And so we have to manage that growth here, as well as the globalization, big shifts in our economy, we had a pretty big hit with the downturn, with the mortgage downturn in 2008. So we're looking at inequ economic inequity and climate change and density altogether. Some of those stresses of housing and transportation and, and, and climate change adaptation and develop this because the sea level rise and affordability and mobility don't know jurisdictional boundaries. It needs to be regional, right? So, so we have, we released the strategy, we're doing monthly meetings. It's, it involves actions being led, not just by our jurisdictions, but by several nonprofit civic organizations in the community. And we're doing a big boot camp with all the mayors locally next week, uh, which I'm very much looking forward to. We have 34 cities within the Miami-Dade County that um, are participating. So wow. it's very exciting regional strategy that was developed in partnership. We're a member of what was called the 100 Resilient Cities Network and now is called the Global Cities Resilience Network. Okay. And they helped us develop that. Yeah. How, how long has Miami had a chief resilience officer? So it really, uh, the position in the Office of Resilience and Sustainability was established in 2016 when we became a member of the 100 Resilient City Network. And that's when I started. So it was three and a half years ago. And um, it's been a fast moving ride since we got here. We, uh, we also did a few things post Hurricane Irma. We learned a lot of things about some of the vulnerabilities in our community uh, with that event. And so we, we've been enforcing new laws to require all assisted living and federally funded affordable housing with elderly in it to have generators with backup power. We are um, increasing our training programs for community emergency response volunteers, particularly in our low income communities. So we've trained 100 new volunteers in that program since the hurricane event and are building these these um, cert, what we call cert teams so that they can be the first responder in the event of any kind of disaster. Another thing we did to respond to heat is we have a number of elderly people in public housing that actually don't have air conditioning. And so we made sure that anyone who couldn't afford an air conditioner who had a health reason to have one that they got an air conditioner to um, address that issue. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of different things. We've been sort of building the train as we're driving it. <laughs> so that's why uh, you mentioned earlier in last month, just a couple weeks ago, we released our Miami Forever Climate Ready Strategy, which is much more holistic, comprehensive look at the city's response to climate change. Everything from uh, making sure we have the right data coming in to make decisions and to adapt to changing conditions over time. So we have a lot of partnerships to 
generate data from citizens, from sensors, from, uh, from our university partners to inform decisions from consulting partners. Um, we are working with a consulting group on updating our stormwater master plan where we've digitized all our stormwater equipment throughout the city and, um, and done surveys of all our seawalls to understand the conditions and where there might be vulnerabilities. And so with that, we will get a prioritized list of capital improvements that have the highest cost benefit analysis for reducing flooding in the city. Um, they will be modeling the impacts of rain events, tidal events, storm surge events, and what kind of green and gray infrastructure we can, should put in. So that's, that's data driven, that's the infrastructure side. Now we need to think about land use, right? It's also the private realm. How do we help our property owners give them the guidelines and tools to either adapt their property or build new uh, in a stronger way. The good thing is we're building from a strong foundation. Because of our experience, we have in Miami-Dade County, we have the strongest uh, codes related to wind resistance in the world. People have to build to Cat 5 hurricane strength winds uh, here. And that's, that's since the early 1900s or mid 1990s. Um, so, so that's a good thing. And we have medium strong land use codes around flood risk where we need to get to is strong or the strongest. And so that's what we're working towards with our seawall ordinance, our waterfront design guidelines. And we've currently made it uh, available for new construction to build up to five feet above the base flood elevation required by FEMA. So that uh, without any impact on people's height restrictions. So, so that provides a little more incentive to build more resilient, but we know we can do more. So that's, that's something else we're going to be working on. We also need to think about where we want density in the city and where maybe in the long run, we need to allow for more green space, more blue and green space to absorb the water. Um, we are built on a, a ridge, the rail line here uh, is built along the ridge. And one of the uh, more uh, difficult impacts that we're just starting to see is that those are traditionally have been lower income communities, less to the inland areas. But now the, that real estate, both because we're just growing and more real estate is, you know, there's more demand on that real estate, just regular real estate gentrification dynamics are happening. But with climate change, that may be getting exacerbated. And these are, these are rich cultural neighborhoods in Miami, Little Haiti, Liberty City, a traditionally African-American neighborhood, Overtown with a very rich African-American history and culture of music, um, Little Havana, similar. So, so these are neighborhoods that we want to protect their soul, their culture. And so we're looking at what are the land use codes we can do to incentivize keeping affordability in the mix. I, it's amazing how much you have going on. I mean, there, you've just already, we have more to talk about, but you've mentioned so many things you have, so many programs you have, so many things you've looked at. I mean, uh, is, it, is it challenging? To, it's got to be challenging to be managing all this, coordinating all this. Yeah, it is. It is. It's a, it's a definitely uh, the most interdisciplinary uh, challenge that I faced. And I, I studied environmental science and urban community development because I love the interdisciplinary nature of that work. But this has been the most challenging. The great news is, is that uh, I don't do it alone. I have a small office. But really, the whole city is behind these efforts. So myself and the city manager co-chair co a resilience action group that's led by all the different departmental leaders that I need to implement the strategy, whether it's resilience in public works or our capital improvements or our planning and zoning, building department, our communications, our parks and rec. So all of them, our emergency management team, 
So all of them are on board and get that this is a priority for the city. We've made with the climate ready strategy uh, is a full third of the city's citywide strategic plan. So uh, it makes up that strategic plan. Yeah. And, uh, you know, also I imagine to get all this done, you have to have the political will from really the top, right? It has yeah. to be the marching orders from the top, but then it also has to be uh, the people have to kind of be behind this, aware of it, and and supportive too. I mean, is that do you find that's true? And do you have both yeah. ends of those things? Yes, and that's a process though to build it too. Uh, so on on the top side, our mayor, Mayor Francis Suarez, has not only been a strong leader internally within the city, but he sees it as uh, very important to be an advocate both at the national and global level. So he serves on the U.S. Conference of Mayors as a chair of the Environment Committee and has been very active in uh, advocating for both climate mitigation and adaptation measures there. He also is the only mayor from the Americas, really. There's only two mayors on this task force, but it's called the Global Commission on Climate Adaptation out of the U.N., and uh, he serves on that and has been a very uh, vocal advocate at the global level for the importance of investing in climate resilience and for action on climate change overall. So that's great leadership from the top. Miami is a very diverse city, as I mentioned, and a real tale of two cities. So with 60% of the residents struggling just to make ends meet, uh, you know, working two jobs and still not being able to pay the bills kind of thing. Sea level rise and the slow moving challenges of climate change aren't top priority. So we've, we've had to really make sure the narrative is such that it, they understand it is something that the city needs to invest in and make it. So as part of the development of our Miami Forever climate ready strategy, we went out in those neighborhoods. We provided translators, childcare, and food to get people out. And we got, we showed them some of the current and increasing risks related to heat and flood and storm risk through some maps, visual maps. And then really spent most of the time hearing from each of them what their biggest concerns were. We wanted them to tell us what are they most worried about increasing heat? What are they most worried about as it relates to storms and flood events and changes in development patterns? And, and, and get their ideas on what we can do to work on it together. This isn't like government, we're here, we have all the answers, we have a, you know, some superpower cape because we don't have all the answers and uh, you know we we need their input and need their solutions and really their partnership. There's no way that we can be adaptive and resilient to these challenges without our citizens, our businesses taking action themselves. No, sure, no, it makes a it makes a lot of sense. Um, jumping around a little bit, <clears throat> you know sea level rise. I'm, I'm just still fascinated by this because I've seen so many maps around the world that says, yeah. hey, in 2100, it's going to look like this, right? This part's yeah. underwater and that's underwater. Um, you've mentioned some of what's happening already, changing in codes, things being built higher. Um, I don't know if it's right to ask if parts of the city will have to be abandoned. You mentioned maybe parts of the city will have to be thought of differently. Well, maybe this has to remain an open space. I've always wondered, you know, are different cities going to have to become more like Venice? Are we going to have to live on the second floors of our buildings and get around in different ways? So what's kind of, uh, there's maybe five or six different angles or questions in what I just said there, but what's, I want to, I want to dig into that, that thinking of like really long-term, you know, yeah. 50, a hundred years from now. Yeah. So in all our plans, we think of this as, as adaptive, right? So, you wanna you want you don't want to build infrastructure that probably won't last more than 40 years for a 2100 plan, right? So you want to build for 2060 right now mm -hmm. if it's a 40-year lifespan. So we're using 2060 
sea level rise projections for some of our stormwater infrastructure, for instance. But we do have to have that short, medium, and long-term view of where this might be going and having those conversations with, with residents. So, so there may be a situation where, okay, so right now in this neighborhood, we're going to expand the pipes, we're going to um, maybe elevate the road a little bit, and then and do those backflow prevention valves. But then we may come in in 20 years and put in a pump station if we need to. Uh, and or we might start to talk to the residents about incentives, transfer of development rights. Um, some may want to sell out, and then that gives us some capacity to direct water there. Uh, and and maybe we put some increased density in another area where we can actually invest the dollars in the infrastructure. So I think it's going to be very site specific. We, I've had just conversations earlier this week with someone who was proposing a pilot of converting some homes into amphibious foundations. Wow. In other words, having pilings on uh, uh, along the corners of the home and some sort of floatable device that can work with with a tidal event you it would just rise up i guess they've done this in some areas of europe and so we like to learn from our partners uh, across the pond <laughs> as much as possible and um and so i think we want to be open to that those in kind of innovations, whether it's a floating sidewalk or a float, floatable home, uh, we want to be open to that as well as more traditional homes on stilts or, or actually moving. It's going to be isolated. There are certain areas that are high enough in Miami that could last a very long time. So that's why we want to think about how do we really invest in those areas because it's going to be cheaper to handle the infrastructure in, in those areas. But when you see those maps of two, three, four, five feet of sea level rise, they do not take into account what the cities might be doing to invest in protecting those areas. I see. So that's with inaction. Mm -hmm. That's what it looks like. But as we elevate roads as we elevate seawalls as we put in other infrastructure and people protect their homes it it could look different and uh right. not quite as dire <laughs> <laughs> well that that was really interesting that idea of an amphibious home and i i mean i've seen yeah. this is common with a lot of piers or docks right they can go up and down on the on exactly the pilings exactly with, with in the fact water. it was a firm that was doing that work that is the one that's um, expanding into this type yeah. of and like you know these these things might sound uh, very different or strange or whatever, but I mean this is we have to be open, we have to be creative, we have to be innovative. I mean this is kind of the the new world that we're headed to. Um, yeah, human engineering is amazing, so let's see what it can come up with. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm I'm curious about I've, just in the news lately. There's been a lot about. The rate of climate change may be accelerating or some of these things accelerating right the pace yeah. picking up especially as ice is melting and i think that we just are hearing about antarctica being in the mid 60s and upper 60s and um what does that do to your your mindset uh as you're doing all this planning like okay maybe the the forecasts might not be right so we have the advantage here in south florida of a multi-county compact called the Southeast Florida Climate Change Compact. And one of the things that we uh, came together to do was establish unified sea level rise projections for our planning purposes. And, and because, you know, the seas know no boundaries, it's better if we're all planning on the same level. We know that those are, are going to change over time. So just in December, they released the updated projections, right? We had 2015 projections, now we have 2019 projections. And so that gets cooked into our, and uh, will be cooked into our stormwater uh, infrastructure planning. But that, that lends itself to the point of why it's so important as we design, whatever we're designing, a drainage system, a seawall, a, a building, to think of adaptability in mind. So. 
uh, when we're building a higher elevation seawall, make sure that it's built with the kind of construction that you can just add on top of it rather than having to reconstruct a whole seawall. Or in our pre-board ordinance where we were allowing buildings to build higher, we also, for large commercial buildings that may not want to build their first floor really high because it's not as accessible to a pedestrian, they can build their first floor ceiling higher and uh, and not have an impact on their overall height, and they can adapt their floor wow. over time. Wow. Uh, so we have to have that adaptability mindset in all our design and thinking yeah. because of those changes. There's so much unpredictability in terms of we really haven't figured out what the changes in precipitation patterns are yet. So, so th that's one of those things that's going to be tested. That's why we need greater flood sensors out there and really be able to understand how the, um, to verify our models, essentially. Sure, sure. Uh, something you mentioned earlier I, I want to follow up on is also, uh, you know, maybe the economic impact of all of this or how climate change impacts the financial picture for Miami and how it adapts, you know, uh, the different revenue sources you have, the different expenses you have, and how that equation might, might uh change as the landscape yeah. changes, as the climate changes? Yeah. No, that's a critical question and a question we, um, we kind of lead with, with our, with our strategies. So uh, we already participate in the National Flood Insurance Community Rating System, which allows our residents to get a 15% discount in their insurance rates. We are going uh, looking at a strategy to get a further reduction in that in terms of, and that's through different uh, land use and building codes, education outreach tools, et cetera. Um, and then we uh, talk a lot with Moody's and Fitch bond rating systems, right? So, so they've gotten more sophisticated in their questions around what Miami is doing to address its climate risk. And so far, because Miami has been so proactive and putting dollars into in its investments and attracting matching dollars from state and federal and private partners, um, because of that, we actually have a higher bond rating than we've ever had in, uh, I think in Miami's history, it's a double A, and part of that's just good financial management. It's not all about the climate risk piece, but but um, but that's an important component of it. And so as we come out with this stormwater master plan, it's really important for us to look at the what's the business case here? What's the what are the impacts of inaction on our property values, insurance rates, ability to get a mortgage, et cetera? And then what are the benefits if we uh, do these investments to preserving property values and the economy and all of that, and, and really to help uh, both figure out where we invest the money, but also to attract uh, financing and funding to invest in it. Uh, it's, a critical, it's a critical question. Certainly, most of our income is from property taxes, so we, we are dependent on those property values maintaining. Sure. Well, uh, that's interesting. Hopefully some other communities that aren't quite as uh, active, you know, on climate change will be incentivized to move, move things along, you know, by, by these big firms and, and the bond people and all those folks that are really realize the reality of this and, and the economic impacts it can have. Right. Um, I also want to ask, you know, about uh, how you guys work with the state and the federal government on this, um, because I, I think all levels of government are necessary in this in this climate response. Yeah. And so, what's what's your relationship with with the state of Florida, with the federal government, federal agencies? How how does that work? How are they helping you guys along? Yeah, great question. So, I would say with the new governor coming into the state of Florida, Ron DeSantis, uh, it's really changed for the positive. The Former government was uh, not terribly active or even denied sea level rise and climate change. Um, this one is 
much more supportive, has hired a chief resilience officer, has invested more in funding for coastal resilience and more for overall climate risk vulnerability studies at the state level, and particularly done a lot of investment in protecting water quality, which is also another impact of climate change. Um, and then, at, so that's been a great, uh, a very welcome improvement. And actually the state helped fund part of our stormwater master plan, as well as some of those backflow prevention valves. I meant they provided us matching funding for both of those investments. We continue to seek other grant funding with them as well as at the federal level, we are, we, the city of Miami and the county are partnered with the Army Corps of Engineers on a study, longer term infrastructure investment to protect the city against the impacts of sea level rise and storm surge. And it, this is something that if approved, the federal government would pay 65% of the investment. It's in the billions of dollars of investment. And then the county, state, and city would be putting in for the some combination of those three for the remainder of the 35%. Um, these are major storm bar surge barriers on our rivers and, and, um, and even much higher larger walls around our, our largest, most urban waterfront. A lot of issues to address with those proposals, um, which we will be doing over the next couple of years, but, but that is an example of something positive where we are working with the federal government. Uh, as you know, and your listeners know, the federal government in general has taken uh, a slower pace a uh, much slower pace, even if not a reversal pace in really addressing the impacts of, of climate change. And that's something we really need to turn around. We, you know, let's first start with addressing the root causes and, and cause at the federal level and the international level, that's where we really need leadership on carbon mitigation and um, maybe using those policies to help invest in adaptation. You've mentioned a couple of times uh, where Miami is kind of in the international scene. You're part of the, the international yeah. coalition of cities. Uh, you've got some of the strongest building codes in the world and all these yeah. kind of different pieces. But um, what are some of maybe the, the other cities in the country or other cities around the world um, where you have maybe a, a real nice partnership with or you've really learned from or you're keeping an eye on because of some of the things they're doing or maybe some similarities in the you know, situations yeah. you're facing? Yeah, absolutely. So we leaned heavily on Boston's climate adaptation strategy when we created ours. I thought it was really strong. And, their, and particularly their, their treatment of the waterfront was really interesting in terms of a combination of green and gray infrastructure. So I've turned to them. New York has a very robust program and plan. Of course, they have more resources than the city of Miami, but they, you know, their design guidelines for infrastructure are really robust, as well as their carbon mitigation plans. City of Norfolk uh, is also been very active. They have a double challenge of both sea level rise and subsidence of their land. So uh, very vulnerable. So they've definitely done some uh, important work there that we've learned from San Francisco. We've done some learning. So those are the U.S. based. I would say Rotterdam and Amsterdam, you know, the, the Netherlands. Uh, I was there the last summer. They, they've definitely been here often to help think through some of our solutions. They are probably the top water engineers in the world. Yeah, the Dutch, uh, the Dutch have a, a long, strong tradition of, of dealing with, uh, with water coming in. So. Yeah, yeah. So, so they've they've been very helpful. New Orleans uh, in the uni United States as well. So, I would say, and we've got a very strong peer network, uh, both through the hundred resilient cities. I also participate in the urban sustainability directors network. So, those are strong networks which I can, you know, reach out to someone by an email or a text at any time, and it's very helpful. Yeah, I guess in closing, uh, like. 
there's a lot of challenges. There's a lot to work through. It's complex. It's ever changing. But what makes you optimistic uh, about Miami's ability to adapt and about having a, a resilient, sustainable future there? I think the level of activity and passion and interest in this city to uh, address this challenge is what gives me the most hope. And it's really from all sectors. We have our chamber on board making this their priority. We have certainly many nonprofit partners and community-based partners. And then the various jurisdictions I mentioned, we're gonna be getting together with all the cities next Tuesday. So, so that kind of momentum, that kind of, there's something going on about how the city's responding to this challenge every day. There's not, a, I can't be at everything. There's so much going on. So that's one. I think the other is that Miami has already demonstrated its resilience to so many challenges in the past, whether it's a hurricane challenge or a big immigration wave or a economic collapse. And we've not only bounced back, but we've thrived in the face of all of that. So that also gives me, um, gives me hope. Fantastic. Well, Jane, I'm uh, grateful for your time. A lot of great information. I can't wait to keep watching what's happening down there in, in Florida. Uh, but thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Travis. Thank you for the opportunity. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop. Thank you to the sponsor of this episode, the Flume Smart Water Monitor that tracks your home's water use 24-7, alerting you to excessive water use and leaks. Use promo code Waterloop now for 15% off at flumetech.com. You're in the Waterloop. Waterloop.